The gospel lesson for this second Sunday after Trinity is found in Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. I've entitled my message this morning, Life with a Purpose. Reading then from the Word of God. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. They went to another village. And as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the bed de dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. The story is told, which involves Yogi Berra, the great catcher for the New York Yankees, and Hank Aaron, who used to be the home run king of Major League Baseball. Berra was, was known for just constant chatter behind the, the plate. He did so to try and encourage his teammates, but he also did it to try and bug the batters, to distract them, to get their attentions off the ball and, and on to some other situation. And one day during the World Series when the Milwaukee Braves, of whom Hank Aaron was a part, and, and the New York Yankees, of whom uh, Barrow was a part of the team, they, they uh, they met in the World Series, and, and Hank Aaron came to bat during, during the game. And as he did, Yogi tried to distract him by saying, Hey, Hank, you're holding that bat wrong. He said, You're supposed to hold it so that you can read the trademark. Well, Aaron didn't say a word. But on the next pitch, he hit it into the left field bleachers for a home run. He trotted around the bases, and after touching home plate, he looked at Yogi and he said to him, I didn't come up here to read. <laughs> you know the saying, aim for nothing and you'll surely hit it? Well, that's, that's pretty true. I mean, a person with, without a goal is kind of like Alice in the fairy tale, Alice in Wonderland. At one point in the story, she has a conversation with the Chesser cat. And she asked him, would you please tell me which way I ought to go from here? Well, that depends, the cat said. Uh, uh, it depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Well, I don't care, much care where, responded Alice. Well, then he said, it doesn't matter which way you go. <laughs> and that's true. Now, Jesus was a man on a mission. Jesus was a man with a purpose. And he lived his eyes, or lived his life, excuse me, with his eyes fixed on a certain goal. And he allowed nothing, nothing at all, to distract him from reaching it. Note the very first verse in our text. You, you, you might just pass over this, and, and that would be a, a sad thing if you did. Luke tells us as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That word resolutely is important. It means that he knowingly, intentionally, firmly, and purposefully set out to accomplish his goal. This was his moment of destiny, if you will. If you're familiar with what happened in 1980 in the Olympics, you know that the U.S. Olympic team, hockey team, defeated the Russians in, uh, in the semifinal game of that Olympic hockey tournament and then went on and, and won gold.
from, uh, by beating Finland in the next game. How many of you know where you were? When, yeah, see, there's hands that go up. It's, it's, it, I know it's not on, the, on a par with knowing where you were when Kennedy was shot, because I can remember that. But I'll tell you what, it's indelibly etched in my mind. I know exactly where I was. I could take you to the place in the pharmacy I worked in, <laughs> where I was standing. Do you believe in miracles? You remember Al Michael? <laughs> they won. Now, Herb Brooks, the coach, was not well liked by his players, at least until after the tournament. If you've seen the movie Miracle, I think it pretty accurately depicts his relationship with the with the players. He was hard on them. He was merciless. He drove them into physical condition that they probably had never even dreamed of. When they won, he wasn't satisfied. When they lost, well, he just railed on them. He had a goal, and he wanted to impress that on them. And he made a powerful statement in the locker room before that Olympic or before that semifinal game when they played Russia. He looked at his players and he said to them, you were born to be a player. You were meant to be here at this time. This is your moment. If you've seen that movie, you know what a powerful moment that was. Well, Jesus resolutely set himself toward Jerusalem, knowing that that meant he headed toward the cross, toward the tomb. But Luke also points out something here to us that we don't often think about. And here again, it's important for us to be cognizant of what he writes here. Because his goal wasn't to go to Jerusalem to go to the cross or to go to the, the tomb. Both of those were essential. But he was headed beyond that, Luke tells us. He was, his, his ultimate goal was his return to heaven, we're told. That was his ultimate goal. The cross and the tomb, as I mentioned, were necessary events, but in a sense, they were necessary obstacles that he had to pass through in his path in order to reach his goal. He didn't just purpose to go to death in our place. His goal was always to return to his rightful place in heaven and to let nothing, nothing at all, stand in his way. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. When he tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and then he said about Jesus, who for the joy set before him, and that would be the return to heaven, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I'm here to tell you today, if you're a follower of Jesus, a disciple, then you too need to have a purpose in this life. And that purpose must be to follow Jesus and to do his will as we make our way to our ultimate goal, which is life in heaven with him. We are, in the meantime, on the road, if you will, his disciples. That means we are followers of Jesus, not of someone else. That we are set to learn from him, that's our commitment and that we will adhere to what he says, and we will share the message that he has for us with those around us as his disciples. Now in our text, it records a series of encounters Jesus had with groups or with individuals. And we can learn valuable lessons about discipleship and about life with a purpose as we study them. In each case, these encounters were negative. Negative in the sense that they demonstrate to us failures to deal with the various roadblocks, those things which can and do stand in the way of practicing a true discipleship. Impediments, if you will, which could ultimately prevent us from reaching our goal and accomplishing the purpose that God has for each of us. So I want to briefly consider each of these four. And may God, by his spirit, challenge us in our own thoughts of discipleship and in our own lives and the purpose and goals that we have. The first encounter is that with the townspeople, the Samaritan townspeople of an unnamed town. And the roadblock here is a willfulness, if you will. 
Jesus sent messengers on ahead to let the people in this village know that he and his followers were coming there. He wanted them to have advanced time to be able to prepare to receive him and to listen to that which he no doubt had in mind for them. But we're told in verse 53, sadly, that the people there didn't welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. So when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and then they went on to another village. Now, it wasn't the size of the party traveling with Jesus which led to the refusal of the Samaritan women to welcome him and them. It was Jesus himself with whom they took exception. Luke tells us that Jesus was heading for Jerusalem, and that fact offended the Samaritans. Richard Lenski comments, and I quote, They've heard of his miracles and know all about him. He's now proceeding to Jerusalem there to display his powers. Is passing right through their land, right past their sanctuary on Mount Gerizim, and acting as if their worship amounted to nothing. This aroused their displeasure to such a degree that they refused to receive Jesus, end quote. Now, whether or not Jesus took offense at their actions and their attitudes, we aren't told. But Luke is careful to record the actions of the apostles and Jesus' response to them. James and John certainly took offense when they saw Jesus mistreated in this way. After all, he is the Lord. They should have received him with great excitement and great enthusiasm. But they told him, just keep passing by. And so they wanted to pull an Elijah, if you will. Call down fire from heaven and destroy these people. A couple of warm-hearted apostles there, huh? <laughs> But Jesus rebuked them for their attitudes, for their desires, and they just simply went on to another village. Now, some later manuscripts include these additional comments of Jesus, the words of rebuke that he used. Jesus may have said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now, I don't know that Jesus said that. That may have just been a later addition to the text and, and, and kind of an editorial comment, but I do know this, that even if Jesus didn't say exactly that, that which is recorded in those later manuscripts is certainly consistent with the attitude Jesus had and with the kind of things that he would have said in rebuke of, of the disciples who wanted to see destruction come upon these people. And that's why I mention it. These people were willful. These people were proud. These people thought that Jesus should have been interested in them rather than them being interested in him. How is it for you in terms of your discipleship with Jesus? Do you welcome him in? Is it about you when you talk about discipleship, or is it about him? Is it about what you want, or about what he wants? Is it about what you're willing to do, how much you're willing to give, or is it about what he desires from you? We need to consider those questions as we consider encounter one here with the Samaritan townspeople. The second encounter is with a man who I'll call an idealist. And the roadblock for him, the impediment to reaching his goal, was a failure to count the cost. They're walking down the road, and a man approaches Jesus, and he says to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, I said this man was an idealist. He was also very superficial in his assessment of Jesus and of the whole process of uh, discipleship. He grossly, if you will, misunderstood the nature of true discipleship in Jesus' name. You remember the old Christmas poem that talks about the children, visions of sugar plums danced in their heads? 
Well, in a spiritual sense, that's kind of the way it was for this man in his idealism. Visions of sugar plums danced in his head. He saw only fame. He saw only glory. He saw only the, the, the positive side of things, but he was only looking at one side of the coin. Richard Lenski insightfully comments of this man, and I quote, he sees soldiers on parade, the fine uniforms, the glittering arms, and he's eager to join, but he forgets the exhausting marches, the bloody battles, the graves, end quote. This man failed to count the cost. Now, Jesus didn't refuse this man. He just set him straight. Look, you're, you're, you're looking at only one side. The fact is, foxes have holes, birds have nests. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You think this is all glory? You think this is all glitter? You think this is all about fame? Uh-uh. Ministry is down and dirty a lot of times. It's difficult. And discipleship has a cost, and you need to count the cost. William Barclay puts it well when he writes, it's possible to be a follower of Jesus without being a disciple, to be a camp follower without being a soldier of the king, to be a hanger-on in some great work without pulling one's weight. He goes on and he says, once someone was talking to a great scholar about a younger man. He said, so-and-so tells me that he was one of your students. And the teacher just answered devastatingly, Barclay says. The response of this teacher was, well, he may have attended my lectures, but he was not one of my students. You get what he's talking about here. There is, isn't there, a, a world of difference between attending lectures and being a student. How many of you attended lectures in college? Nobody wants to admit that. <clears throat> I was never that way. I just skipped physics to play racquetball. <clears throat> I'm really proud of that now. <laughs> uh, there is a big difference between attending lectures and being a student. And it's also, sadly, one of the supreme handicaps of the church that in the church there are so many distant followers of Jesus and so few real disciples. How true that is, unfortunately. Last year I bought the first new boat of my life sold off my 26-year-old Sylvan and bought a brand new 2014 Alumacraft. My, what a boat. Talk about visions of sugar plums dancing in your head. I tried to be real calm when they made this, you know, really good offer. I couldn't wait to get out to the pickup to call my wife and tell her what a deal it was. Yeah, lots of glory, lots of glitter. Now I'm 12 months into making payments. I still like the boat, but I've come back to reality. <laughs> we had to count the cost before we made the decision, and we did. So you count the cost, and then, and then you pay the cost. <laughs> and that's part of counting the cost too, isn't it? You have to make the payments. You have to realize the ramifications, the consequences of the decisions you make, the commitments you enter into. Now, did this man follow Jesus as he offered, as he promised? Let me ask you, would you? Have you counted the cost? We need to do that when we consider this whole thing of discipleship. We can't be romantic. We can't only look at one side of the coin or one side of the issue. There is a flip side, and we need to count the cost on both sides of the issue. You need to ask yourself, first of all, what must I give up if I do follow Jesus? And then you need to ask yourself on the other side of the issue, what will you lose if you don't? And both of those questions, both of them are important 
when we consider the cost of discipleship. In the third encounter, Jesus meets with another man. This time, Jesus invites him to follow him. But here the problem, the roadblock, is that of misplaced priorities. He said to another man, we read in verse 59 of our text, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now Jesus invited this man to follow him, but this man, as I said, had misplaced priorities. He wanted to go and first bury his father to take care of some of these matters at hand. And Jesus' response is not demonstrating here any lack of care or or any lack of respect for the dead. What he is declaring here by comparison, and we need to understand this, is that it is far more important to minister to the spiritually dead before they die. Because there is an eternal consequence to not knowing or following Jesus. Life is the living. It's not the dead. And we should be more concerned about people going into hell than we, are, than we should be about observing uh, the respect or, or, or the kind of display we would give for those who have already departed this life. And again, we need to ask ourselves, did this man heed Jesus' warnings? We don't know. Would you? What are your priorities? Are they misplaced? Are you concerned more for the here and now than you are for the here and after? Be warned today and be challenged by the Spirit of God as he would apply this encounter to your life. In the fourth and final encounter recorded here, we see another man who promises to follow the Lord, but he's tentative in his approach. That's the roadblock for him. He's a man who expresses willingness to follow, but it's conditional, isn't it? I'll follow you, Lord, but first... Let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, this man's request seems innocent enough, but what's going to happen? I mean, will his relatives understand or support his decision? Or will they seek to dissuade or perhaps even to force him from service for Jesus, begging or, or perhaps even demanding instead that he stay home and fulfill his requirements towards them. Life, friends, with a purpose is life headed forward. You can't look back. Lot's wife looked back. It didn't go well for her. Discipleship is moving forward, following Jesus. And we cannot be tentative about our discipleship. Those who spend their Christian lives looking back at the old days or at what they've given up simply are not fit for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus uses a a farming illustration here. Can you imagine what a field would look like if a farmer hooks on the plow and heads down the field looking behind him rather than ahead of him as he plows? Can you imagine what the field would look like? Can you imagine the kind of reputation he'd have in the community? Be people who would drive by and say, what in the world was that guy doing? Was he drunk? He's crazy. He shouldn't even have got on the tractor. And this is true with respect to our discipleship, too. We need to follow Jesus. We need to move ahead. Did that man follow Jesus ultimately, or did he go back home? What would you do? How do you approach the topic of discipleship and its practice? To summarize these encounters then, I would tell you again that life, the Christian life, is a journey. It is a life lived with a goal, and it is life lived along the way to that goal with purpose. The goal is the celestial city eternal life and glory with Jesus. But the purpose along the way is to follow Jesus on that trip and to carry out his will for our daily lives. Science isn't just about the discovery, it's about the quest. Those who search for a new medicine, 
will go through all sorts of failures with respect to a certain um, healing or, or, or curative power. And yet, as they eliminate things, they continue to move in the right direction. And sometimes things that they find along the way can be useful in other areas. It's the way it needs to be for us. Athletics, it's not just about the victory. It's also about the training, the development, the learning, the growing. I mentioned the US Olympic team from 1980 a few minutes ago. Their attitude about, or their assessment of, of, of Herb Brooks after that experience was quite different than it was as they trained. Now they began to appreciate that through which he put them and the commitment and the sacrifices that they'd made because they were better for it. And they reached a goal. And that's what God wants for you and for me. And even the training and the discipline and <laughs> the sorrows and the hardship along the way are purposeful and can accomplish good. The Christian life is a goal-oriented, purposeful walk, a walk in the footsteps of Jesus who has gone before us. If a man were going to hike cross-country from New York to Los Angeles, he'd require seven, several things, wouldn't he? I mean, he'd have to have a great determination. There's no room for tentativeness. He'd have to make adequate planning. There's no room for romanticism here. He'd have to be willing to be adaptable to changing circumstances because there'll be things that he couldn't plan for that he couldn't have foreseen, and he's got to learn to be flexible along the way. He's going to need roadmaps to guide him. And the fact is that we as believers have been given the Holy Spirit to live within us. His word is a light to our path, a guide for us. He's given us the sacraments in which he would meet us and strengthen us and keep us moving forward. And then we need to have a commitment to keep looking ahead and not behind. I don't know where I'd end up if I took off from New York and tried to make it to L.A. looking behind me. But I don't think it would be L.A. How many of you think you could make it to L.A.? <laughs> yes, Jesus went to the cross. He died on it. He was placed in the tomb. But the outcome of Good Friday is not in doubt, is it? Because Good Friday was followed by Easter, and Easter wasn't the end either. Easter led to the ascension. Jesus fulfilled his purpose and he achieved his goal, that goal that he so resolutely set out to accomplish. And now we are to follow him. We are to take heart, or take to heart, excuse me, the exhortation of the writer of, of Hebrews. And I want to read those verses as we close our meditation this morning. G, or the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witness surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. He knows the way to the goal. He reached it. He'll help us to do the same. So live your life with a purpose, not your own, but that of Jesus, your Savior, and you'll reach the goal that he would have you set out toward that of eternal life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. First of all, thank you that you sent your son into this world, that Jesus came into this life to accomplish your purpose. He had a goal set before him, and it wasn't just a short-term goal. Ultimately, he wanted to take again his rightful place in heaven alongside of you. But along the way, he fulfilled your purposes as he accomplished, as he reached his goal. Nothing could dissuade him from that. And Lord, as we would follow Jesus, help us to follow resolutely. Help us, Lord, not to be tentative. Help us 
to weigh the things that are before us, to count the cost of discipleship, to realize what it's going to cost us, but to also realize what we would lose if we were to give up this life with a purpose. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to throw aside that which would weigh us down, discourage us, the sin that can entangle us, and instead to follow Jesus, that we might reach our goal and have lived our life with a purpose, his. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's turn in our hymnals.